Hey, everybody online. Hi. Man, I don't know about you guys, but after that lab, like I actually feel kind of like tired and drained. <laughs> it's kind of exhausting. I, yeah. <laughs> I didn't even do it. <laughs> hey, Mackenzie. Yes. My attendance thing's not working again. Okay, let's see. Neither is mine. Okay, I can do that. Let's first of all make everybody present for the lab this morning. Brooke, did you mean to say you had attended the lab online? Oh, no. I guess I just clicked. Oh, it said online attendance also. <laughs> okay, so Trevor, you're online. Karina, you're online. Um, Gage, you're here. Brooke, you're here. Zach, you're here. Bernice is here. Susan, Michael. Darren, are you online? Yes. Okay, do you need me to do your attendance too? Is it not working for you either? Yeah, it's not working for me either. Okay, I will do that. Um, so then, Kingston? Is that here? Not online yet? Mm -hmm. okay. Alrighty. And can you believe it's already the third week of school? No. no. I really liked it once I get to the third week of school that I was going to go on first two. Always really sucks for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we will get to our three um, topics in just a second. Next week, in Moodle, you have this practical radiation quiz. Let me show that to everybody online. Right here, this quiz next week, that is from your practical radiation technician booklet. Okay, um, it's over the first, I think, eight chapters, but chapters are about a page. So don't freak out when you hear eight chapters. Um, it's a great resource. I think it's very, very straightforward and easy to understand. It has a really good explanation on a lot of the different types of PPE that you will see. We don't use every single type of PPE you might be required to use in the workplace to do our training. When we do our Rad Worker 2 training, the most that you might be asked to do on the Rad Worker test at the end of the semester is put on a double set, which is, we've been putting on a single set, the overalls and two gloves, a double set is two of everything, and then ends up with four gloves, right? So you're double encapsulated. That gets really hot and sweaty, so most of the time we don't ask you guys to do it. But this has a lot of information on various other types of suits that might be used respirators, positive pressure suits, where you might have the whole suit with a little bit of pressure, so it's pushing radiation particles away from you so they can't get into the suit. So it's a good overview. Not as great as if we had every piece of equipment for you to look at, but some of that equipment is really expensive and your lab fees would be really high. So this is kind of our, our compromise. We get some of the easier to acquire equipment, you get really good experience with it, you get your Rad Worker 2 certification, and we're gonna read about some of the other options you might be trained on in the workplace. So be aware that that quiz is specifically over the reading. Reading doesn't take too long, but uh, do make sure that you've done that before it's due and it's due Sunday at 11 p.m. the fourth week of classes. Just wanted to make sure you guys were looking at that. Okay, this week, we have a radiation dose quiz, which is going to be um, from the lecture materials today. We're going to start with showing some videos, though. 
Let me make sure the sound is shared. Okay. How many of you watch the INL donning and doffing instruction videos on your own? Most of you. Okay. All right. So we're going to look at just a couple things that I want to point out as they go through. The this. purpose of this training video is to demonstrate a suggested sequence for donning a single set of radiological personal protective equipment. Did anyone notice that so they said it's a suggested set? Did anyone know, or sequence, did anyone notice that this is exactly what our posted um, order is for donning or doffing? Do you guys think it is exactly the same? No. <laughs> or PPE. You may be directed by radiological control personnel to don your PPE differently than the sequence shown. The PPE shown in the video is for training purposes, and the PPE you encounter in the field may be different. The first step to donning PPE. Do you like her uh, modesty clothes there? <laughs> the first step to donning PPE is to review your radiological work permit, or RWP, to verify the dress category required. Hey, Mackenzie, we can't see it. Can't see it. Okay. Okay, what about now? ...will be performing. Yes. Next, retrieve the required PPE and thoroughly inspect it, looking for cuts, holes, unsewn or unsealed seams, or other obvious damage. Ensure you wear your personal dosimeter on the front of your body, somewhere between your waist and neck. Preparing tabs... So she's got her tabs of tape here with the folded over tab right here, right? Her per personal dosimeter, we haven't done a very good job of this because I kind of just hand you guys a dosimeter and I say we're going to wear this for the, for the particular scenario we're looking at. So going forward, we're going to be a little bit more careful about this. A personal dosimeter is one that is not an electronic dosimeter, it is not one that you calibrate for a specific job it is the one that you will be given for a quarter and you will wear at all times in the radiological buffer area. So when I got to ATR, when I got to MSC, sitting in a rack at the gate to enter the fenced area of the facility, my dosimeter is sitting right there. I take it, I put it on, I wear it to my office, I wear it in the conference room, in the cafeteria, everywhere inside that fence. And then I also wear it underneath my overalls into any radiological area. If I can wear it under my overalls, what kind of dose is it counting? Will your will alpha go through your coveralls? So what's it going to count? Yeah, inside my overalls on my person. What's it going to count? Beta gamma. So it's a whole body beta, beta gamma dosimeter. You're going to wear it for an entire quarter. You'll get your dose counted each quarter. And at the end of the fiscal year, you'll get a year long dose report that comes from this dosimeter. In addition, certain jobs may require you to wear an electronic dosimeter on the outside of your overalls that is designed to alarm if you enter a field of radiation that has a higher dose rate per hour than you're supposed to be in, or if it counts an entire dose of higher than you're supposed to get for that particular job. So your electronic dosimeter is going to be calibrated for the particular job that you're doing. It's gonna be outside your PPE, inside a Ziploc baggie, tape her overalls, which she shows and we're gonna start doing. And it is designed to prevent you from entering an area where the field of radiation is too high or receiving too high of a dose for a particular job. It does, it has an audible alarm. 
and a digital readout. These personal dosimeters, which she's wearing right now, have no readout or audible alarm. Strips of tape in advance will be helpful since tape is difficult to work with once you are wearing gloves. While seated, don the rubber boots. Boot liners may be worn to aid in putting the rubber boots on, but are not. This is something we all don't do very well, is we tend to, I think, hurry through putting on our PPE. And I watch a lot of you jumping around balancing as you put on your PPE. When you put on PPE, um, as we talked about this morning with the lab group, um, they got very task focused and we had some little errors that occurred because they weren't looking at their environment. They were trying to get the job done. In the nuclear industry, our first goal is not necessarily getting the job done. Our goal is getting the job done correctly, which means safely and right the first time. So when we're putting on our PPE, we're not rushing through that process. We're making sure we do an inspection and then we're gonna sit down and we're gonna make sure that we follow the procedure and put the PPE on in the correct manner. And, you know, I haven't enforced that standard very much in the class because I wanted you guys just to get familiar with the fact that we take PPE on and off regularly, right? Now you guys are a little bit more familiar. Now we're gonna get the details right. So when we started with adding inspecting our PPE this semester, now it's sit down, look at a copy of the procedure, and we're gonna make sure that we're doing this exactly right each time. Those of you who have repetitively had issues getting your rubber booties off over your shoes, the shoe covers do help make them slide off your shoes easier. So if you haven't tried the shoe covers, which are optional, you might give it a try. Yeah, Michael. So like the day wear goes, would you take off the rubber booty and still be in the, the buffer zone and then take off the liner as you step out? Or would you take off the, the leopard stretch you want to step out with the liner on? No, you would treat your liners like your last layer. And so that is also another reason it makes it easier because you can be inside the area you can lean right on something um, if you use your overalls, right? And you can pull the heel of that boot over the heel of your actual boot. And then it's just a lot easier to proceed from there. Not required. Next, put shoe covers on over the rubber boots. Next, don the coveralls up to your waist. Do this in a controlled fashion so you don't rip or tear the coveralls. If you do get a tear in any of your PPE, notify radiological control personnel who will determine if the tear can be repaired or if you will need to get new PPE. And I always do this step and tie the arm sleeve around my waist because if for some reason I have to pause, finish a pre-job brief, deal with a delay in work, I'm not getting so hot and sweaty as when the overalls are fully up, but I have done a lot of the steps, right? So I'll do this and I'll tape my ankles and then I'll wait. And then when it's like, okay, now we're actually ready to go and proceed, I'll put on the top, I'll put on the gloves, I'll put on the tape and the hood and finish, right? But I can hang out with the pants part on and the um, sleeves tied around my waist way longer than I can hang out comfortably in the entire assembly, right? Next, tape the coveralls to the rubber boots near your ankles. This is done by placing the tape on the seam between the coveralls and the boots, with half of the tape over the coverall cuff and the other half on the rubber boot, fully sealing the seam between the coverall and boot. I also like to do this a little bit higher than you guys are doing. A lot of you are taping right near the base and you tape that shoe cover tab into your boot and tape and overall assembly and it's really hard to get undone, right? It's also hard to reach down to your tape 
while also being controlled and being aware of where the rest of your body is if you're having to reach that, especially if you are maybe in a not great size set of overalls that kind of poop out as you bend over and you have to try to hold them so you can see. So if you pull your overalls up a little bit and tape a little higher on the booty, one, the thinner part of your leg, you can use a little less tape, which just makes things easier. And two, you'll be more comfortable reaching down to remove it. I just think it's slightly better. There's no rule that says you have to do it that way. I think it just makes it easier. Tabbing the ends of the tape makes removal easier when doffing. Cotton glove liners may be worn for comfort. They are not required, but do add to the wearer's comfort by absorbing perspiration. Cotton glove liners are not considered PPE. Next, don your inner pair of gloves. Pull the coverall sleeves out over the inner gloves. Tape the seam between the coverall sleeves and the gloves in the same fashion you taped your ankles. Zip up your coveralls. A tape tab on the zipper pull is helpful. Next, don the outer pair of gloves. This pair of gloves is not taped as they may be changed out during work. Good, All right? At this time, tape the bagged electronic dosimeter, or ED, if used, to the front outside of your coveralls, where you can read it during the job. The ED should be near, but not covering your personal dosimeter. Last, don your hood. If it is an integral hood, simply pull it up over your head. If it is a separate cloth or Tyvek hood, put the hood on your head and then do up the snaps or Velcro fastener. Radiological control personnel may tape the hood down and back to prevent it from falling over your head should you bend over. You are now ready to enter the work area and perform the task identified on the RWP. Yeah, Brooke. Yeah, will you ever be wearing both, so like the coverall hood and one of those hoods? Usually not, simply because they serve different purposes. An integral hood is usually only used when you're going to put on a second set of overalls because you've got the hood for both that you can use. I don't think that INL's overalls even have integral hoods because they use the separate hood item because it's just so much more effective at keeping any contamination that might fall on you off of the rest of you when you doff it because you can do that very correct clean. It's harder to do with an integrated hood. Yes. I never did. I was never fitted for a respirator in all the work that I did and all the places I went. We actually try very hard to control contamination so that you don't enter areas where it's bad enough that respirators are required because respirators require fit testing. They require a physical for you to be allowed to use one and they make work really hard. Like if you guys think the PPE, the single set is uncomfortable. And of course our just generation of going through this education while having to deal with COVID may not care about respirators as much as previous generations have because we have to like wear face masks constantly, which is just new to our society, right? But usually we try to avoid having scenarios where you have to use a respirator unless you really, really have to. Um, yeah. When you did jobs, did you prefer having the cotton glove liners on? Did they like that you could have your house or made a difference? I didn't like them. I have really short and fat fingers. Like my hand is just, it's, I think it's kind of weird shape. And so I struggle to get my fingers all the way into gloves. I have like this tip that's just annoying. But if I go any smaller, they're so tight, I can't move my fingers well. And so glove liners add another layer 
to my husband affectionately calls them sausage fingers. Um, so it adds another layer of sausage casing without giving any additional length to fit in the glove. So for me personally, I find them very uncomfortable. That's why I don't use them. I think sweating in my gloves is also gross. So if you have a different hand shape and they're still comfortable, you might really like them. I, I just find them uncomfortable for my particular hand shape and size. Alrighty. The purpose of this training video is to demonstrate a suggested sequence for doffing a single set of radiological personal protective equipment or PPE. You may be directed by radiological control personnel to doff your PPE differently than the suggested sequence shown. Prior to doffing a single set of radiological PPE, approach the exit point and read the posted doffing instructions thoroughly. First, remove your shoe covers. Do this in a controlled manner to minimize the possible spread of contamination. Remove one shoe cover at a time, placing it into the waste can. Next, remove the outer gloves without touching the inner gloves. Do this by grasping the outside of the first glove, turning it inside out, but not removing it completely. Then use the inside of this glove to grasp the outside of the remaining glove, turning it inside out as you remove it and place it in the waste can. At this point, remove your ED if used and pass it out to RADCON if available. So you're going to notice that she takes her tape, she crunches all of it up. I was just pulling the reusable items out of our trash cans in the lab. Um, and I know that a lot of the tape is not crunched up. We're going to do a waste bagging activity a little bit later in the semester. And as you guys have to take your gloves and try to make sure that all of the waste that's in the trash can gets put into your bag and you stick to the tape that's left in the trash, you're gonna see why your HP techs will hate you if you do not crunch up and ball your tape as your gloves get stuck to everyone else's waste. So even though it is not strictly for radiological control that you want to ball up your tape, you want to have a good relationship in the workplace with your HP techs, they're extremely helpful. If you forget how to do something, if you need someone to check that you donned or doffed correctly, if you're needing help reaching an area to frisk that you're worried you might have brushed against something and gotten contaminated, like those are the people that are there to help you with that. And if they think you're a jerk, you're gonna just have a much harder time working with them, right? So ball up your tape as she does. Do you have a question, Michael? So will there always be a health services there to clear up you when you walk out or are you required? Not always. They're actually incredibly busy and INL can never keep enough HP techs because every time they expand a new job, they need new HP techs trained for a certain area. So um, you won't always have someone there, but you can always call. And as long as you're in a safe place to wait, someone can come. So you, you can always get that help. You may just have to wait a certain amount of time until someone's available. Does that make sense? Yes, and the expectation as Rad Worker 2 is that you will normally be able to do all of this by yourself. If, you know, the, the biggest thing for me uh, that I needed HP help for was there were a couple times that I went through facilities where you just, you're scooting in between pipes and I just rubbed my back along something and then as I was taking off my overalls, I noticed a tear. And that spot right here on your back is really hard to reach. Maybe it's easier for some of you. And so I felt that I wanted to make sure before I left the rad boundary and frisked out that I got some help because I had a reason to believe there might be more risk that I got contaminated, right? And so I asked for an HP to help me reach that spot. Um, so, you know, it's a good thing when you have a specific reason to say, hey, I need an extra check on this but there is an expectation that you're able to do this base level of competency. Do this by carefully opening the bag and sliding the ED partially out of the bag for the radiological control technician to grab. 
If an HPT or RCT is not available, slide the ED out of the bag and onto a tray or onto the step-off pad outside of the CA. Next, you will remove the tape from your wrists and ankles. This is done in slow, controlled movements so as not to spread possible contamination. A good practice is to roll the tape into a ball and place it in the waste can. At this point, doff your hood. For a separate hood, remove it by slightly leaning forward and pulling the snaps or Velcro fastener apart. Then lean back slightly and pull the hoods backwards off your head, letting go with one hand, allowing the hood to fall to one side and place it in the laundry or waste can. If this is done correctly, at no point will possibly contaminated PPE go over your head. So this is one that I've noticed we're all doing slightly different and I want to have us be a little bit more consistent, right? So lean forward, remove that hood, lean back and you're going to let go with one hand. And as it drops back, you take the hand and put it into the tip. Did you guys online, were you kind of able to hear and see what I just demonstrated there? Slightly. Okay. We'll make sure and cover it next time everyone's in lab. Um, okay, Kingston, if I can deal with that attendance in just a second. All right, let's keep going. If it is an integral hood, simply pull it backwards off your head without touching near your exposed hair or skin. And next, remove your coveralls. Carefully unzip the front of the coveralls, taking care not to touch exposed skin or clothing under the cover. Just didn't lean forward there. Lean forward so as you zip, anything that's on the outside of your coveralls falls away from you instead of being flicked back onto you. Coveralls. Grab the front of your coveralls near the shoulder and pull them off your shoulders, turning them inside out as you roll them down towards your boots. See how as she did that with her arms, because she didn't try to shimmy both arms out at the same time and rub up our hips where everyone, everyone found contamination after our last lab, right? She took them off to her shoulders, held, held the overall, removed one, held the overall and removed the other. So she can move her arms away from her body instead of slide them up her body. That will help everyone have less blow dirt on the hips. Does that explanation make sense, everybody online? Yes. Okay. Continue to roll them inside out until your boots are showing. You will then slide your coveralls over your boots or step back and pull your feet and boots out of the coveralls. Make sure you do this in slow, careful movements, making sure you keep all PPE inside the CA boundary at all times. Be careful not to touch any walls or waste cans with a portion of the body not covered by PPE. Next, remove your boots and boot liners if worn, one at a time, as you step over the CA boundary and onto the step-off pad, taking care not to step down in the CA or allow your gloved hands to cross the barrier. As you do this, place each boot into the waste can. Now remove your inner gloves using the same techniques you use to remove your outer gloves and place them in the waste can. Remove glove liners if worn and place in the waste can and bring your hands out of the CA barrier. You are now ready to proceed to a PCM or frisking station for a whole body survey. Okay, those are posted on Moodle and I do recommend that you regularly review those, especially as we get closer to the test. 
I don't know if I am going to give the test or if they're going to send someone from INL to give the test. Um, but either way, INL provides a testing rubric. And every little one of those steps has a grade next to it. Did you go in the correct order? Did you touch your inner clothes? Did you use the correct technique on the gloves? Did you bend uh, lean back correctly with your hood? So each little piece of making sure we don't spread that contamination is really important. Any question on that? Is that when we get our red food certification and we'll be getting? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, it, it may be overalls without an integrated hood. It might be our equipment here. I'm trying to get them to come certify our lab to do the training so that if they send a tester, they can do it here. Because right now they want you guys to go up to Idaho Falls to CEI and do the test there. I want them to let the test happen here. Um, one, because we have to pay CEI, I think it's like $3,000 for you guys to go take the test up there, um, which I'm perfectly capable of. <laughs> so it seems like we shouldn't duplicate that effort. Um, but that's, it's just, it's just a little political, right? They make money off of that. They want to keep that capability there. And so I've been working with INL for them to come down here. And it adds the double benefit of any INL employees who live in Pocatello could now take their renewal test here too. So we're hoping that'll work out. Okay. When we talked about exposure and contamination, you guys looked at this little um, illustration, right? What was the big difference between contamination and exposure from the reading you guys did prepping for class today? Brooke. Exposure is when something is like irradiated and contamination is like it can almost be like wiped off of you unless it's like an internal thing of contamination so it's on like the outside of you which is external. Yeah. So I always say it as contamination is on you or in you, exposure is around you. What do you think is the most common type of radiation interaction you have as a rad worker? Contamination. Why contamination? Because you wear PPE to prevent getting something irradiated. Okay. What else? Anyone have a agree or disagree? I agree. Agree. Karina agrees. Okay. Susan thinks it depends on your shielding. Okay. I feel like it's always around you technically. I think it's not around, but like an exposure is always technically. So we get some background exposure and some background contamination, like Michael was saying, because there's radioactive dust around us. We might breathe in radon in our brick basements. We're exposed to cosmic radiation. So background wise, you get some of both. And depending on where exactly you live and your eating habits, like if you like Brazil nuts a whole lot, you're ingesting a whole lot of radioactive potassium, right? But background is separate, right? I'm talking about as certified radiological workers in the workplace. Do you think you, Get exposed to contamination or exposure more? Brooke. I think it's contamination because you're working with a lot of like materials that can produce like dust and things. And then I think that there is a little bit of exposure because like when you're around like an actual reactor, I think that's where the most of that like exposure would come from. And then the rest of it is contamination. Okay. Michael. With exposure, what do you think you said like things all insulated like have a lot of like insulation sources? So that not quite so you're actually going to get pretty much constant radiation exposure because you will be around objects that are radioactive 
the reactor, the materials you're preparing in samples, the fuel that you're handling. So that exposure means that radioactive material are going to give off a form of energy. Like right now, I'm being exposed to light, right? If I had a shield between me and the light, I'd be in the dark. So what Susan said about it depends on the shielding. We try to reduce our amount of radiation exposure, but there is still exposure around us that we're monitoring for. If you're in an area where exposure is the only concern, you actually have far less PPE requirements because radiation exposure ends when you move away from the material that's exposing you. If I walked out into the hallway, I would no longer be exposed to this light. So I only need a little bit of PPE to reduce the amount of light that's hitting me. Or maybe I've decided that for the 50 minutes I stand here for this lecture, I'm getting an acceptable amount of light and I'll just wear a dosimeter to record it, right? That's exposure. Contamination is when it gets on you and in you. Ideally, we as radiological workers are never contaminated. You do not want to leave an area and have the radioactive dust that has contaminated a surface get onto you through your PPE and leave with you. That is one of our largest goals, right? First is our safety. Next is reducing the spread of contamination. So we try to never end up with contamination exposure, either internal or external. Did you have a question, Zach? No? Okay. Internal contamination is great. Would you like to know how to determine how much uptake you have if you get internally contaminated? Sure, right? Yep. They make you collect your poop and give it to a health physics tech and they count it. Great. Charming. Wonderful experience. So we don't want contamination. If for no other reason, then you don't want to have to carry around a cooler of your poop. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, and so they give you what looks like a lunchbox cooler, but it has a biohazard sticker on it. <laughs> and so my friend, who was who he was with DOE, he was doing some oversight when they opened up a plutonium capsule and plutonium dust kind of poofed out of it because they didn't do the right thing. And he luckily didn't breathe any in, but they had to monitor everyone who was in the vicinity. And so he had to carry his little biohazard cooler on the bus around everybody, into the office around everybody. And then, of course, he planned a hunting trip and they have to collect samples for a certain period of time as, the sam as any uptake might process through your body. So his whole hunting trip, he had to collect and keep it in a cooler. So we don't want contamination. External contamination, this is the main reason that we wear our paper PPE, right? If we're talking about something that's a lead apron that you'll read about in your rad manual, if we're talking about lead line gloves that we're using in a glove box, now we're talking about shielding beta and gamma. But our paper overalls and hoods and our tiny plastic gloves, this is preventing external contamination from depositing on our skin and in our hair and on our personal clothing. And when we take off our PPE, we're leaving the contaminated PPE inside a waistband in the contaminated area. It doesn't go with us when we leave. Does that make sense? Does that make very clear the difference and why the answer is that we get exposures and we don't want contamination? Everybody online? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Awesome. So, I pull my mouse over here. When we're talking about exposure and contamination, there are actually several different units that can be used. Based on this shielding, just real quick, what type of particle is being blocked by this piece of paper? Alpha. What particle? Yep. What particle is being blocked by this piece of plastic? 
Beta. Beta. Thick lead shielding. Gamma. And a hydrogenous plastic or water. Neutron. Exactly. Good job, guys. Okay. I always say this wrong. I always say it wrong. And I always tell myself I'm going to listen to it pronounced before I say it in class so that I say it right for you guys. Ronkin, somewhere close to that, is a unit for exposure. So this defines the effect that radiation coming off of an object, going into the air around it, will have. This unit can only be used for exposure to gamma and x-rays. So if this is my radioactive piece of material, and it's sitting right here on a table, and it has gamma rays coming off of it, I have a certain exposure here. I have a certain amount of less exposure here. Because that gamma traveling through air is what I'm measuring. And that exposure that I'm measuring is in units of Rankin. Rankin. Something between those. Rankin. I was forever made fun of this in the workplace. I just can't say it. I don't know why. Okay. Once I have accounted for that exposure and the gamma rays have come off of this material, at some point they're going to hit me. And they're going to be absorbed into the body. Now we're talking about a radiation absorbed dose or a rad. So this is what can come off of the material and be exposure and hit me and be absorbed. We can have a rad in any material and any of any type of radiation. So there's a rad for alpha, beta, gamma, neutron. And an x-ray. We don't really care about them very much in our industry. So we're not going into medical, but x rays as well. It doesn't account for where you absorb it, or if it's a child or a grandma who absorbs it. It's just the amount of radiation that can be absorbed. Does that make sense online? Yes. Okay. Ronkin equivalent man is when we take this material that can come off, the radiation that can come off this material and is an exposure and then is a rad and can be absorbed. Now we're going to measure the dose equivalent in human tissue. So our equivalent, right? Ram, equivalent man. Uh, the they all they're all men in the workplace. So everything in radiation is actually standardized for men's body. We know. Dose equivalent in your body. So when we talk in units of rim, or more commonly in the workplace, millirim, because we get such small amount, now we're saving, saying we've accounted for how much radiation is coming off that object can be absorbed in your body. And how specifically that type of radiation is going to affect the part of your body it went into. Equal doses of different types of radiation in RAD can cause different levels of damage to the body measured in RAM. If I have an alpha dose in RAD coming off of that material, and it hits my hand, I might get basically no rim because my skin is going to block that alpha. But if this radiation is in a vial of powder, as we saw in the glove box today, and in some manner that powder spills or gets airborne, and I breathe it in, the rim dose to my lung is going to be huge. Because that alpha is going to bounce around and deposit the air beads out escaping, right? So the same source is capable of being absorbed, the same amount of rad, whether it's on my hands or in my lungs, can give a very different rate. 
everyone understand that? Online, get following. Yes. Okay. When we go from rad to rim, we use a weighting factor. Okay. This is the factor by which the absorbed dose is multiplied. So alpha is only multiplied by that weighting factor if it is absorbed into your body. So if it is an inhalation or ingestion, or if you have an open wound, it happens to get exposed. So instead of being blocked from entering your bloodstream, that alpha gets into a void, right? Beta, weighting factor of one. Gamma is an x ray. One, neutron, energy dependent. Is we have fast and thermal neutrons. Depending on what energy they are, higher energy neutrons are more damaged. So to go from rad, to RIM, your health physics engineers or um, health physicists, certified health physicists, are going to do a calculation involving the type of radiation and where on your body it's hitting you, external, internal. The lens of our eyes is very sensitive. It gets a different calculation than the rest of our whole body. So when you get your report on your total dose in you know, 100 millirem, your health physics team has accounted for you on what actual damage was done to your body. And that's the report you're getting in RIM. Any questions? Is the weighting factor Q factor? That's the same thing, right? Correct, yes. The symbol for weighting factor is a Q. So right here, RIM is your rad times your weighting factor. Sometimes this is just called a Q. Okay, this hopefully is review. RIM to millirim, multiply by a thousand. Millirim to RIM, divide by a thousand. What is RIM? Bronkin exposure man. Bronkin equivalent man. Okay. We just talked about all the ways you can get a dose, right? So that is how much exposure I have stood here and received over the amount of time that I'm here. So maybe by standing here for this long, this exposure comes off and ran, this my body becomes ran, and I got eight millirems. That's because I stood here for some amount of time. When we look at the exposure coming off of our radioactive substance, we get a dose rate. Perhaps this is 18 millirem per hour. So if I stood by an 18 millirem per hour source for an hour, what would my dose be? If I stood by an 18 millirem per hour, Source for one hour, what would my dose be? 18 millimeters. 18 millimeters. So when I talked about your electronic dosimeters that can give you an alarm if your dose exceeds the amount for a job, or if you stand in a field with too high of a dose rate, counting two different things, right? There are type, there are dose rate fields that can give you radiation sickness instantly. And that's why it's important that we alarm if our dose rate is too loud or too high. Your overall dose is controlled below uh, regulated limits. That's why we alarm on our dose. What about distance? Distance, the further away I am from this, the less exposure I can get and the lower my dose rate field is going to be, which means the lower my dose will be for standing in that dose rate field. Yeah, so radiation decreases by one over r squared. It's an inverse um, square. So every distance I take, oh, one over that distance squared is how much I decrease the exposure. Michael. What's the max exposure that you would be 
Uh, actually, it was Chernobyl when I got 500 milligrams. Oh, really? Yeah. Before that, the highest one I'd ever gotten was 300 milligrams. So your back count is probably more than in the first place? Uh, yeah. Yep. Especially when I used to fly for work. Okay. Any questions on that material? I don't have a question about the material, but I do have a question for you, Mackenzie. Okay. Sure. So I emailed Jonathan Scott Sunday, and I haven't heard back from him. Would you suggest emailing him again or maybe seeing if he has some office hours? I think he's going to come to our classroom on Friday so you guys can all set up a time to operate. Okay, but uh, I know I still need to view the lab that reactor laboratory, too. Yeah, um, he's coming off of getting sick, so I would just wait until he comes to class um, and then set it up. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I just know he hasn't been super responsive even to me just because he's been sick. Okay, the dose quiz has some questions off of this material as well as this PowerPoint that um, I just made unhidden right here, units of radiation. Um, with what we just covered, if you understand it, you should be pretty good, but it does also cover fever. So the um, non-US unit. So if you are not sure where a question came from on the quiz, probably came from that slide. Okay, all right guys. on Thursday.